Welcome to the first ever Hard Fork Live. I'm Kevin Roos, I'm a tech columnist for the New York Times. And I'm Casey Newton for Platformer. And we have a great show for you today. We have such a great show, should we sit down? Yeah, let's sit. And just to sort of uh, you know, give you guys a little insight into what's gonna happen today, there's two parts to today's show, okay? There's banter, and then there's canter. So first we're gonna banter, and then we're gonna bring on canter. So that's basically what you have to expect. Yeah, so uh, it is great to be back. This is my first uh, South by Southwest since the pandemic. Uh, I think you were here last year, right? I came here last year because it was cryptomania and I was not going to miss out. <laughs> and uh, this year, is it again cryptomania? Uh, I have been led to understand that crypto is now dead. So <laughs> RIP, but we did have a great time here in 2022. <laughs> um, it feels so good to be back here. I, I really love South by Southwest. I think we've, you know, we've been coming here for many years. Um, what are some of your, what, what is your best South by Southwest experience and what is your worst South by Southwest experience? Well, I mean, the true best experience uh, is, is boring, which is just the food in this town is incredible. They make the best taco in the world. It's a true. Pueblo Viejo, I love you for life. The, the funnier story though, is that the best South by Southwest thing that I ever did was that I saw Shingy and Shaquille O'Neal in conversation. <laughs> Shaquille O'Neal, legendary basketball player, Shingy, the former digital prophet for the AOL Corporation. And uh, I could not tell you what their panel was about, but in terms of just like sort of two entrepreneurial people saying nonsense words to each other in front of marketers for an hour, I was in heaven. Iconic pairing. Um, my best South by Southwest experience, uh, I think, was b back when I first started coming in maybe 2011, um, my uh, former, my, the late great David Carr, my former colleague, um, and and Jay Wortham would throw these these parties for journalists and tech founders, and I just remember thinking like, oh, this is the center of the universe, um, and it was it was so much fun to hang out with your friends. Okay, what about your worst South by Southwest experience? Um, <laughs> well. Um, it, I, I'm going to say this was my worst, but the truth is I actually enjoyed it. So I was looking for something to write about for The Verge, you know, who, which has spent a bunch of money to send me here for a week. And I found this panel, which was you could try to solve a fake brand crisis. And so they put us in a, in a hotel room. Like a tabletop exercise for NATO, but like exactly right. for a it, brand crisis? It, it was like a red team exercise because, you know, some people had been food poisoned or something. And uh, they had a fake version of Twitter that they had set up with with, like fake mean tweets that came in and we had to respond to them in real time and um, it was utter madness but like that is the, that's the true South by Southwest and I love it yeah what my, was yours my, my worst South by Southwest experience was the year that I had a uh, late night scooter accident and uh, and hurt myself and you know what's worse than hurting yourself on a scooter is telling people that you hurt yourself on a <laughs> yeah. scooter. Uh, it was humiliating for the rest of the weekend. If it was like, what happened? I'd be like, uh, long story. Uh, <laughs> you should see the other scooter. <laughs> exactly. Um, so Casey, we were gonna talk about a lot of very important things today, but I think we should start by talking about what's going on at Silicon Valley Bank. Yes, this uh, is an extremely serious situation. I'm sure, raise your hand if you know what we're talking about when we say Silicon Okay, every hand in the room just went up. Yeah, so uh, this has been a big deal that's been unfolding over the last, I would say, 48 hours, really. Um, so what, what, what should we talk about with Silicon well, Valley Bank? Well, you know, the, one of the main differences between you and me is that you were actually a banking reporter at one point. It's true. And so I feel like you have um, maybe the, the edge on me here. So as, as best as you have been able to figure out, why did SVB go under? So it's, you're right, I was a banking reporter um, early in my career, and so I, I've, I've reported on a few bank failures, and, and they take, it takes a while to figure out exactly what happened usually. But in this case, what we know is that Silicon Valley Bank, which is a, a sort of mid-sized bank, it's the 16th largest bank in the country. Um, it's got about 200 billion, or it had about $200 billion in deposits. Um, and it really catered to a tech crowd. I mean, lots of startups do their banking at Silicon Valley Bank. A lot of venture capitalists have money there. It's sort of the, the kind of community bank of the startup sector. And in 2021, that was a really good thing to be because the economy was booming and money was flowing into the tech sector. And so Silicon Valley Bank all of a sudden had record inflows of money from Huge the deposits. Huge deposits. And so when you're a bank, you have to 
do something with those deposits. Well, do you? Well, you don't have to, but yeah. you usually like to make a little bit of money. Yeah. Um, and so they turned around and bought a bunch of sort of long-dated securities, so mortgage-backed securities, other assets that would yield, you know, somewhere in the neighborhood of one and a half percent, which was a lot back then when interest rates were near zero. You wanted to be able to get more than zero on your money, so they went out and they bought a bunch of stuff. It's a fine move, except if interest rates rise, as they have now, you know, you can get four percent interest on a treasury bond, and so those bonds that are yielding 1.5% no longer look so good. And when that happens, at the same time, as interest rates are rising and putting a lot of startups in, in need of cash, those customers pulled out their cash. And so all of a sudden, Silicon Valley Bank needs to sell these bonds to meet its obligations. So it sells them at a loss. And this is like... at. at at like your normal mid-size, you know, Midwestern bank, this is not going to be like a life-threatening crisis. This sort of thing happens from time to time. It happens. Banks sell assets at a loss. They run into liquidity issues, and they sell. They raise some short-term capital to deal with them. Life goes on. But Silicon Valley Bank is not a normal bank. Its its customers are you know high information, high sort of. You know, they're aware of risk and volatility, they're watching the stock charts, they're looking at the bank's financial statements, and crucially, they're talking to each other on Twitter all day. Right. And so when some- and so once again, we found an area where Twitter is causing the collapse of civilization. <laughs> <laughs> Behind every civilizational collapse, just ask yourself, is Twitter involved? Yeah, it usually is. It usually is. So the tech people on Twitter start talking about this, start saying maybe this bank is in trouble, they start, you know, VCs start telling their portfolio companies to pull their money out of Silicon Valley Bank. And so now, you know, as of yesterday, Silicon Valley Bank is a failed bank. It has failed. It has been taken into receivership by the FDIC. Um, and it's, it's a sort of stunning collapse. I was in uh, the San Francisco airport on my way here yesterday, and there were a lot of very worried looking people in Patagonia vests, like talking into their AirPods. Um, and I think we should just say this is a this is a bad situation. Very bad situation. It's, uh, it's very serious because, you know, it's not just about, you know, uh, a handful of startups. Tons of companies use uh, SVB to run their payroll. So depending on what happens over the next few days, there may be thousands of workers who are not getting paychecks and who knows what sorts of uh, wild ripple effects that could cause. Totally. And I think it's notable, too, that this, even though Silicon Valley Bank is a tech bank that caters to tech customers, what did them in does not appear to have been some crazy high-tech thing. It wasn't like they were taking customers' deposits and like buying worthless crypto coins or investing in like crazy risky startups. It was, it was a pretty old-fashioned bank run, the kind that we see at lots of different banks, except this bank is obviously bigger and has more important clients. And also this bank had made what I understand to be an unusual bet on low interest rates sticking around for a really long time, right? My understanding is that most banks lend out money for people to get mortgages, for example. Uh, the Silicon Valley Bank customers mostly weren't getting mortgages because they were using the bank to run their startups, and so Silicon Valley Bank had to find something else to do. That turned out to not be a great business. Exactly. So Casey, you are a Silicon Valley startup owner. Yeah. Are, are you a client of Silicon Valley Bank? Well, so I have two, uh, I, I have one, I would say, legitimately funny Silicon v uh, Valley Bank story, which is that the day before it collapsed, uh, they uh, pre-approved my mortgage application. <laughs> <laughs> it is unclear what the status of this application. I think this means you get a free house. Well, I mean, <laughs> ideally, if you're going to owe money to anyone, it would be a bank that no longer existed. Yeah. So uh, I'm, I'm going to sort of see about that. But, you know, th there is a, a, a more serious thing that I wanted to bring up, which is that, um, you know, I, I do run my business uh, platform, a very, very small business. I only have one employee. Thank you. And um, this, uh, my company, I use a different startup bank, a much, a much smaller startup bank, um, which, which I'm <laughs> not going to name so as not to cause more panic. But basically, three months ago, I started to get the same kind of text that people were getting about Silicon Valley Bank over the past. Telling week. you to pull your money out. Saying, pull your money out, saying there, there's a run on the bank, and it, at the very least, you want to make sure that you were underneath the $250,000 FDIC insurance limit. And a lot of my friends in the startup community were talking about this, and so 
we did move our money, and then a few weeks went by, and then nothing happened. And I thought, okay, fine, false alarm, whatever, the bank was able to weather the storm. Never did I assume that within three months it would happen again, but at a much bigger bank, and would actually take down the bank. So there was this great column uh, by Matt Levine in Bloomberg yesterday uh, writing about these issues, and Matt kind of suggests in that column that it might not be a good idea to run a startup-only bank because your customer base is not very diversified um, because of that mortgage issue that I mentioned. Like You're not able to sort of do the kind of lending that generates those really stable long-term returns. And so as I'm thinking about the future of my business, part of me is thinking, well, gosh, like maybe I just move all the money to Chase because I know I'm not going to find myself in this situation. Right. Most banks do not have clients that come predominantly from just one sector, and that sector is not very sensitive to the same kinds of economic forces that we saw happening at Silicon Valley Bank. Yeah. So from here, we should talk about what happens. Because yeah. Because there, there are going to be more dominoes to fall, um, not necessarily more banks to fail. This may have been contained, but Right now, Silicon Valley Bank is ha being held in receivership by the FDIC. Um, I think the most likely next step is that they get sold, right? This happens all the time with banks. You know, they close down on a Friday, they get taken into receivership. The FDIC, you know, works to guarantee deposits, and then they sell it off to some bigger bank that comes in and takes over the loan book and all the assets and liabilities, and then they just keep running that bank with the clients. And I think that's probably the most likely outcome here um, as we, as we, you know, as things stand. You know, some big bank, one of the big banks, is going to want to own this thing, right? Yeah. Th these are valuable clients. These are valuable client relationships. Silicon Valley Bank has built up a lot of goodwill in the tech industry over the years, yeah. in part because they would take bets on startups that no one, no other bank would touch because they were too early or it was too risky. And um, for what is it, like the reason that I applied for a mortgage from them is because I am not a traditional mortgage applicant. I don't have a W-2, right? I have like this subscription business that if you're Chase, maybe looks weird, but if you're Silicon Valley Bank, you know, they've seen much worse businesses than mine. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> so they have a sort of a special place in the tech economy. And I think for that reason, they will get bought um, fairly quickly. I think the question is how quickly does that happen? And do startups that bank at Silicon Valley Bank who don't have access to their money right now, do they have to line up some kind of emergency bridge financing or find some way to make payroll in the next couple of weeks while they wait for their deposits to be available to them? Yeah. And, and if, you know, look, if, if all we're talking about is one missed payroll cycle, I think the startup ecosystem can probably absorb that. We've already seen stories about like companies like Stripe and Brex stepping in to provide that sort of bri bridge financing. So I think all that can probably be withstood. I think my, my big, and you know, maybe one of my last questions here is uh, most of the deposits in this bank were not insured, right? Correct. Because you're only insured up to 250K. They're mostly working with businesses that have way more in the bank. Do you think if what you say is going to happen happens and the big bank buys the smaller bank, do they wind up insuring all of those deposits and you're going to get like 100 cents on the dollar for what you deposited? Yeah, I think for most depositors, the most likely scenario is that they get all their money back. Yeah. There may be some, you know, universe in which depositors are not made whole, but that happens very rarely. Usually when these kinds of bank failures happen, the big bank comes in, snaps up, no one loses a cent, they just take over the loan books and, and everything works like normal. I think there's some chance here that there will be, uh, you know, maybe a haircut for investors, but I really don't think that's a likely scenario. Well, I have to say, if everything that you um, have said happens, I feel very reassured. Like, this doesn't actually seem that bad to me if they do this. Well, it's there, but there's a big if in there, right? Which is if they can line up a sale to a big bank, if they can make depositors whole pretty quickly, if the startups are able to bridge themselves. But I, I think it's also fair to say that if that doesn't happen, if this this doesn't resolve uh, in the next few days or weeks. Um, it could be a very painful period for a lot of startups and startup investors. Yeah, and in the meantime, if you have any recommendations for a mortgage lender, uh, please just let me know after the show. I am in the market. You're going to get mobbed in the hallway. <laughs> uh, but I, I want to just say one more thing before we transition to, to Jonathan Cantor, which is that I think there's been a sort of trend among some Silicon Valley leaders of really disparaging regulators and regulation. And I think one lesson of the past 48 hours is that at least bank regulation seems to work really well, right? Yep. 
I mean, this wasn't some unregulated crypto casino where like investors have no recourse if their money vanishes, it's just gone forever. Like the FDIC has an efficient and orderly process. They go in, they start winding down the bank, they start lining up, you know, what to do with the assets. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a success story for traditional financial regulation. And I think that a lot of the, the people in Silicon Valley who are very skeptical of regulators are gonna really like, they're gonna owe their, the survival of the startup sector to that very same regulation. That's right, and actually in Europe, they subject banks to a test, including can you withstand one of these sudden spikes in interest rates, which is apparently not a test that we subject American banks to. So as usual, American regulators have something to learn from European regulators. But speaking, speaking of, of American, American regulators! regulators. Did you ever imagine in your wildest dreams we would be able to do something that in sync because we didn't even practice? All right, uh, that was the, how did you enjoy the banter portion of today's show? Good, okay, great, great. Well, we're now transitioning to what frankly I expect to be an even better portion of the show uh, because it's time to talk about antitrust. Do we have any antitrust heads in the audience? <laughs> Me too. Kevin, antitrust is so important. It keeps the market healthy and competitive. And our guest today is somebody who thinks more about antitrust than certainly anybody who's ever been on Hard Fork. Uh, Jonathan Kanner is the Assistant Attorney General, runs the Antitrust Division at the Department of Justice, where he has served since 2021. And in particular, he has been a thorn in the side of big tech companies, specifically Google, for years now. And under his leadership, the department is getting really aggressive in its cases against big tech. We're very excited to talk to him. Please Please welcome Assistant Attorney General Jonathan Cantor of the Justice Department. Hello. Hello. Great to see you. Welcome. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming to Hard Fork. Yep. Um, I want to start by reading a couple of the monikers that the press has given you uh, over the years, having you react to them. So you've been called, uh, quote, top antitrust cop, Google foe. Big Tech's arch nemesis and an anti-Google legal warrior. That one was by the New York Times. Um, how does it feel to be uh, referred to as something like a, a Marvel villain? <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say hero. But, uh, <laughs> um, and, and did you get that from a chatbot? <laughs> yeah. Well, speaking of chatbots, I heard that you, you consulted one in, in picking out your outfit today. I did. So um, I've got colorful shoes on, as folks here might be able to see. And um, I, I asked chat uh, GPT as, you know, when are col when, what do people think of colorful shoes? And the response was, well, it really depends on the context, but if it's a music or art festival, colorful shoes are okay. Yeah. So here we are. I will note, though, that uh, I was going to wear them either way. <laughs> <laughs> well, you are dressed down for a regulator, which we appreciate here yeah. at, uh, at South by Southwest. Um, I, I want to talk about some of the tech companies that uh, the Department of Justice has investigated. But first, I just want to kind of lay some groundwork for this conversation and talk about you and your background and your sort of philosophy of antitrust um, and, and how you got to, to the place you are. So you were, before you were at the Department of Justice, you were a lawyer in private practice working with and for some of the big tech companies. How did you develop your theory of tech antitrust? Sure, so my, my ex, um, experience informs my outlook. Um, and, and I, over time, learned that when we apply antitrust law, um, there are these very formalized boxes and we try to fit everything into this narrow framework, assuming that, for example, consumers will behave rationally and they'll all behave the same way and they'll run from one store to the other. And then, as I got more into tech antitrust, what I realized is that the world has changed in ways that are, uh, over the last 20 years, that are on par with, if not exceed, the Industrial Revolution. Market realities have changed fundamentally. Think about your world today versus 20 years ago, for those of you who are alive 20 years ago. Um, but it's changed dramatically um, in the way we conduct business, in the way we gather information, uh, and in the way we behave as individuals. And so we were applying this old framework that was built for a world of poles and wires 
to a world of ones and zeros. And so from my perspective, we needed to update our framework to reflect those market realities. Well, let, I mean, let's talk in a little bit more detail, right? I think the thing that, that comes up the most is that um, in the past, the main way that antitrust would be enforced is if uh, prices rose for consumers or there was some sort of like obvious financial harm to consumers. But now we live in a world where most of these services are free to use or certainly the ones that regulators have been most interested in like Google and Facebook. Um, and so at the same time, there's been this growing sense that mm, these companies are, are awfully big and it seems like they, there's some anti-competitive behavior that they're engaged in to sort of stay as big as they are but they're free and like anybody could use anything else if they wanted to. So there, there sort of had to be a new, a new theory of the case with regard to antitrust. Is that the sort of new market reality you're talking about? In part, yeah. I mean, ask yourself, is anything really for free? Um, but um, so what are you giving up to get something? Are you giving up your privacy? Are you giving up your data? Um, are you giving up your uh, personal profile that can be used to create in the future? In AI, in AI simulation of yourself? Those are the kinds of questions we need to start answering. The other point I think is really important because when we think of, about price is when we think about antitrust just in the context of price, one problem is that um, we're missing the point of antitrust enforcement and anti-monopoly law. So antitrust principles have been embedded in our society since our founding. The, the Tea Party, the Boston Tea Party, was an anti-monopoly movement in its core. State constitutions talk about uh, monopolies interfering with freedom, right? And so just as we won't tolerate kings, we shouldn't tolerate monopolies who tell us how we have to behave, what we see, what we consume. And so when we're talking about the free flow of information, which is vital to a political discourse, or we're talking about um, uh, information that's used to target us as individuals, those go to the foundation of our, of our democratic values and our fundamental freedom. And it's important that we're protecting competition, the competitive process, so that we have choice, so that we have freedom of choice. We, have, we can pick where we want to work. We can pick what services we want to use. We can pick where we want to buy things. So in the old sort of model of antitrust, the test to apply to figure out whether something was a monopoly is are consumers being harmed by this? This new antitrust framework you're talking about, which is sometimes called hipster antitrust, I don't know if you like that term or not, but that has been applied. Uh, what is the standard of harm? What, what makes something a monopoly if it's not rising prices for the consumer? Sure. I will first be clear, my kids do not consider me hipster in any way, shape, or form, <laughs> notwithstanding my cool <laughs> shoes here. Um, but um, the, the problem is that how do you measure price, for example, in, in a multi-sided market with, um, uh, where, where monetization doesn't take place in a, in a you know, completely transparent way? Um, the, the antitrust laws exist because we believe competition, we believe choice, we believe variety is foundational to our freedom. And so when we focus on competition because we believe that the range of benefits that result from competition are good for society, then that's a much easier thing to measure and that's a much easier thing to preserve. And that's our focus. That is actually more um, adherent to the founding of the antitrust laws going back to 1890. Some of these economic theories that are often um, put out there as to, um, narrow, to narrow the antitrust laws didn't exist when Congress wrote the law in 1890 and then again in 1914 and then updated again. Um, but, but the concept of competition being foundational to our freedom did exist. And so that's what we're reeling is we're going back to the OG. We're not necessarily trying to change it. You know, over the past several years, Congress has considered any number of changes to antitrust law that I think might make your job easier. None of those have sort of made it across the finish line. I'm curious, do you feel like... Um, there are things that Congress could do that would let you sort of more fully realize this vision that you're laying out? Sure, so um, for starters, I have to take a step back and say, well, what's my job? My job is to enforce the law as Congress writes it, and so whatever tools Congress gives us, we're gonna use, and we're gonna use as effectively as we can. And so right now, we have antitrust laws that have been on the books uh, since 1890, 1914, and beyond, and we're using those tools as effectively as we can uh, to, 
realize the purpose of the antitrust laws. We've come out at the Department of Justice uh, with full-throated support for congressional legislation uh, that would uh, allow us to enforce the law in even more meaningful ways. Um, but ultimately, the decision is up to Congress. Um, and my job is to keep my head down and focus on enforcing what we have while we have it. Uh, do you want to tell us like, anything specific they could do, though? So, so Congress, in the last Congress, proposed legislation, for example, that would impact the ability of tech companies to favor themselves or exclude rivals. Uh, that talked a bit about um, interoperability and openness and, um, and making sure that uh, as markets, tech markets develop, they become more. This is um, so like if Amazon is using data from its sellers to then inform what it's making under its Amazon basics house brand, they can't go compete right. with the sellers in the Amazon marketplace. That's one example. These are the exact kind of examples that the, the, the committees that investigated this up on Capitol Hill used and looked at to assess whether um, uh, to revise the antitrust laws. And it resulted in legislation that got pretty far in the previous Congress. The, the one that drives me crazy is uh, Apple Music, right? Because Spotify has to pay Apple some really big percentage of all of its revenue uh, through the App Store. Apple gets to run its own music service. It doesn't have to pay itself anything, right? And so to me, that seems so obviously anti-competitive. Is that the sort of thing, you know, I, I imagine you can't talk about that thing specifically, but like, do you have the law behind you if you want to say, actually, yeah, that doesn't seem right. We want to file a case. Or does Congress need to change something? Sure. So if we file a case, just to be very clear, we believe we have the law yeah. behind us. Yeah. And we believe um, we have the facts to support the application of the law. Uh, without commenting on any specific yeah. matter, I can say that a lot of the problems that we confront flow from conflicts of interest. And so if you own a, plat a platform and then you compete on that platform, now all of a sudden you're kind of conflicted. Uh, and often a lot of the problems that we see flow from that conflict, so that flow from conflicts of interest. Yeah. All right, Kevin, try to get him to talk about Google. Yeah. <laughs> so the, the DOJ has, has <laughs> had two big investigations into Google. Um, what can you tell us about those investigations and, uh, and, and where they might be headed? Good. So we have two lawsuits that we filed, uh, one that's set for trial uh, this September that relates to Google's search uh, business. Uh, and um, we are, are going to bring that forward before a court. And, and what, just in very basic terms, like what is the theory of the case there, that, that Google is, Google search business is anti-competitive because why? Uh, among other things, Google went out and con entered into agreements um, with distribu to distribute its search engine exclusively, for example, through a, uh, a, um, a phone manufacturer or through a browser. Uh, and those in locked up the opportunity for other search providers to um, get the kind of scale they need in order to compete effectively. There are other claims, and we're litigating alongside a number of state attorneys general, um, and they have claims relating to, for example, um, Google's um, elimination of specialized search verticals and others. Okay, so that's one case, the search monopoly case. What is the other case? So the other case is one that we filed um, quite recently in the Eastern District of Virginia that relates to Google's advertising technology business. And um, without going into the specifics of the case, one of the things that we've talked about publicly and that's in our filing um, is that um, advertising technology really more closely resembles a commodities uh, exchange or a stock exchange than it does um, the old Mad Men style business. So one of the things we cite in our complaint is an internal document for Google where it analogizes its business to, for example, um, Goldman Sachs or Citibank owning the New York Stock Exchange. And the reason this um, is interesting is because uh, the advertising technology is sold through an electronic trading market. And there are more trades, I believe, in the ad tech ecosystem uh, than in any other electronically traded exchange um, in the world. Now, that case seems much better to me than the other one. So why did you file it second? Uh, well, I won't uh, weigh in on, on, on that specifically, right. but we file our cases when we're ready. So we investigate, um, and then we are ready to um, bring a case. Um, we, we file it. And so we have a very careful process by which we investigate. We evaluate documents. We evaluate data. Um, we consult experts. And then when we have... Um, the goods, we file a case. 
Uh, that is a really good case, though. Um, l let's talk, though, about the fact that the search market arguably is getting more competitive now maybe than it's been. We've been talking a lot recently about Bing. Bing said that they now have 100 million, I can't remember if it's daily or monthly active users, a third of which are new like since they launched this new chat feature. And one of the arguments against taking too strong a position on antitrust, and I mean, this is the sort of venture capitalists who I spend a lot of time talking to in Silicon Valley talking here, but what they will say is like, hey, look, if you just relax, eventually the invisible hand of the market will come along and introduce some new competition. And I will say, I used to be very skeptical of this idea, and I was somebody who was foaming at the mouth for y'all to come in and break up uh, Facebook and WhatsApp and Instagram. And then three years went by and TikTok came along, and now the entire industry is panicked and they're racing to copy TikTok, right? So I'm just curious how you think about that idea that often if we, <laughs> if we just sort of procrastinate and do nothing, the market is is able to kind of unwind some of these more anti-competitive situations. Is it? So, um, <laughs> um, let's think about this way. Um, what are some of the most important technological changes um, in the modern era? The invention of podcasting, number one. <laughs> I had that at two, but um, we'll bump it up. So. The breakup of AT&T is what led to the hardware revolution, including the patents and the IP and all of the, um, and, and the growth and evolution of the infrastructure that led to the internet. Uh, the case against IBM, the antitrust case that resulted in a massive settlement by the Department of Justice preceded um, the software revolution, uh, Windows operating system and the like. The case against Microsoft uh, preceded the internet revolution and the growth of companies like Google, Facebook, and Amazon. And so historically, if you look at key inflection points, in many instances, that is the most important time to protect competition because the incentive for a dominant firm to squash that inflection point in its nascency is greater than it will ever be. And so one of the reasons, especially in technology, that we enforce the antitrust laws is to make sure that those new innovations have the ability to rise to the surface, have the ability to disrupt the world in ways that we cannot predict and don't want to predict because the beauty of innovation is the uncertainty. And that is what we're trying to protect. Some of the challenges that have been brought to tech on antitrust grounds in the past several years have not worked out. Uh, some of the, the cases that, um, you know, that I'm thinking of, there was a case by the FTC that tried to um, block uh, Meta from acquiring this VR company uh, within that makes a game called, a fitness app called Supernatural. Um, that was just, um, you know, sort of let through in court. Um, is it important to you that the DOJ actually win these cases? Or is just sending a message to tech companies that they can't do you know, these kind of aggressive anti-competitive maneuvers, is that enough? So I want to be clear about this. We bring our cases because we believe we are right on the law and we believe we are right in the facts and we bring our cases because we believe we're going to win. Um, and one of the criticisms over the last 20 years is that the antitrust enforcement authorities haven't brought enough cases. They haven't given courts the ability to confront fact patterns that reflect the modern economy, that reflect, reflect ones and zeros versus poles and wires. And so in that sense, it's really important if we're going to advance the law through the court system that we pr give courts fact patterns so that courts can learn, so that courts can weigh in on, for example, why um, targeting of individuals is different than consumers responding to price increases from one supermarket to another. These are very different markets that require different analysis and until, unless and until we bring those to courts, give courts the opportunities to confront those fact patterns, we're not gonna see the kinds of advancements in the law that we believe and that I believe are necessary to have a workable antitrust framework for a modern economy. You know, um, often when we talk about antitrust cases, we think about them solely in terms of is a merger allowed to go through? But at the same time, in the past, um, y'all have been able to get creative with companies and just attach 
conditions to mergers that sort of make them, I think, more palatable. I'm thinking about um, there was a case involving uh, AOL Instant Messenger where the government insisted that um, it be made interoperable with other messaging platforms. And so for a while, we lived in this paradise where you could sort of use any messaging app to talk to anyone on any other messaging app. To me, that seemed like a really positive application uh, of this kind of regulation. I understand you're entering every case to win, but I'm curious how you think about some of those other remedies and, and whether they ought to be used more. That's hysterical. I worked on that case at the FTC as oh, a second year lawyer out of law school. Nice. Yeah. That was a good one. I just remember Trillium, which was like the mega app. Trillium where you could, was great. You ADM. Could chat with everyone. Shout out to Trillium. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Everyone so, clapping is over 35. Yeah. <laughs> so I think there are, there are there's some opportunities and challenges. Uh, one is that as an antitrust enforcer, I believe that our job should be to enforce the law. Um, I don't view us as regulators. And so um, the idea that we're gonna oversee a company and make sure it, um, its code is structured in a certain way can be very difficult, particularly in the context of a merger. So merger law basically says, hey, um, uh, you know, if, you're, if, you're, if it substantially lessens competition, it may, rather, uh, substantially lessen competition, it has the possibility you shouldn't merge and you should go compete instead. Um, and that is a much better framework, in my view, to let the market figure it out through competition than trying to engineer um, certain outcomes through in, uh, regulation. And over one of uh, a criticism over the last 20 or 30 years has been that antitrust enforcement authorities have settled too many cases um, and those settlements have not worked effectively. Uh, for example, divesting a handful of assets as a carve out uh, in order to um, uh, try to get market shares down to a certain level rather than thinking about whether those divested assets will, act, will succeed uh, in the context of being bought by a new company. And so um, I think it's really important that you know, if we're going to accept a remedy, it really succeeds in solving the competitive problem. So your office has filed lawsuits against Google. Um, you've also taken on a big publishing case involving Penguin Random House and Simon & Schuster, um, reportedly looking into Apple and its App Store. Um, what are some of the next things you think we might see from regulators, including DOJ, when it comes to tech antitrust? The fun part of my job is that I'm not allowed to talk about it. <laughs> well, not normally, but here among just, uh, it's just friends. Just friends, yeah, yeah. all right. Um, yeah, we'll, we, we let our, our filings do our talking, and so um, I, we'll, we'll, we'll look forward. But, but, I'm, but I am trying to be and have tried to be transparent about the kinds of issues we care about. And um, you know, I think about issues that have a really high impact on, on an on our livelihoods, on our lives, um, and technology obviously is you know, core to so many things we do. I will point out, and I think this is relevant to discussion of both AI and uh, specifically in technology more broadly, is that we use those terms as if it's a very narrow um, category. But these are just tools. So every market is in a sense a tech market, right? We're seeing technology issues in healthcare, in, in energy, uh, in agriculture. Um, we're, when we think about AI, for example, we think about AI as a tool that will be relevant looking forward for um, uh, you know, all different types of applications. And so it's really important that we understand that to the point where we're, we, we are hiring and have hired uh, da PhD data scientists, AI experts, um, and we're bringing in expertise to make sure that we have the ability to understand the technology we're seeing. That's great. Um, I want to I want to ask one more question about that because something some, something that you hear from people in government sometimes is that it's hard to attract the talent that you need to be able to go after these tech companies because some things like like the ad tech market is sort of notoriously complicated and you know you can see these some charts. have even said boring. <laughs> I would never accuse the ad tech market of being boring, but you'll you'll hear people saying, oh well, you know, we can't hire data scientists because. They're, they're demanding such outrageous salaries, we can't convince them to work in government instead. So do you feel like your office has the technological expertise that you need to be able to bring these cases? Yes. So um, this is, I think, speaks volumes to the moment we're in right now. 
but we are attracting talent that is off the charts. People want to work on these problems. And so we are attracting our um, head of our expert analysis group um, helped start the AI Institute at Stanford Business School, and she's one of the top economists in the world. Uh, we are hiring former AI scientists, data scientists from you know, some of the large tech companies. Um, we are seeing, um, I spent the last three months touring law schools, and this is a little bit from the data side, uh, and students are coming out in droves, not because they want to be the next Alex P. Keaton, but because they want to help solve these problems, because they care about monopoly power. Um, we have the benefit of having, um, being on the right side of the issue. And people care. I think a lot of people I can see out here are part of this conversation today because they care about these issues. They see the impact. And so we've had the ability to extract, I'm sorry, uh, extract, <laughs> attract uh, talent that it, it, it <laughs> 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 that is, that is uh, in my view, off the charts and has exceeded my wildest imagination. And, and we're building it um, from, from not just traditionally as the antitrust division has been lawyers and economists and paralegals, uh, but we're bringing in data scientists, we're bringing in AI experts, we're bringing in banking experts, we're bringing in healthcare experts, we're bringing in management consultants, people who can understand how businesses make decisions. Um, in many respects, I think in order for us to be effective, we have to mirror the world in which uh, uh, that we, that we, the worlds that we investigate and, we're, and the industries where we enforce the law. We just have a few minutes left in this part of the conversation, but since you mentioned AI, I do want to ask you about AI because I think that's an area where a lot of regulators and politicians are looking right now. It's obviously a very fast moving area in Silicon Valley, and there's one theory that AI is going to be very good for competition because, you know, these things like ChatGPT are coming out of startups and they're, you know, Google is on red alert now and they're having to sort of hustle and be competitive for the first time in many years. As Casey mentioned, we're now talking about Bing, which seems to be a good sign for competition. Um, so there's one theory that AI increases competition because it forces these entrenched, you know, tech giants to, to work a little harder. Uh, and then there's another theory that actually it's going to decrease competition because you need so much compute and infrastructure and, and so many GPUs to run these AI models that basically only the giants can compete. And so you're going to end up with AI concentrating more power in the hands of companies like Google and Microsoft. So which of those arguments do you think is more correct? Yes. Both. <laughs> so uh, let, me, let me give you some insight into how we're thinking about AI. So when I first started um, at the DOJ, uh, it's a little over a year ago now, um, I recognize that AI is probably going to be one of the most significant issues that we have to tackle. Um, so we, we started hiring up the experts. Uh, we have a, a thing we, we call Project Gretzky, which is... Um, Project what? Gretzky. As like in Wayne Gretzky? Wayne Gretzky, yeah, yeah. Where um, instead of skating, he has this famous saying about, I don't skate to where the puck is, I skate to where the puck is going. And so we recognize that AI is going to transform how people do business. Um, I think there are a couple of ways to look at this, um, or, or um, both ways to look at it. So one is AI as a technology, the other is AI as a tool. Um, and so first we want to make sure that we're preserving competition in the technology itself. And that could be everything from the hardware, um, the interfaces that run on top of the hardware, uh, the AI, uh, APIs or interfaces relating to data sets and indices. Uh, and then everything that sits in between. Um, and then there's the application of the, of the technology, uh, and that application might be uh, AI-driven technology. And AI-driven technology has the potential to offer lots of great benefits, but it also has huge feedback effects and scale effects. And so the bigger you get, the more data you have, the more data points you have to train your algorithms and the like, the more markets can tip. The big get bigger. The big get bigger, but exponentially so, which makes it really hard to compete. Um, so we are keeping an eye on all of that. There's an added dimension too, which is kind of fun from an antitrust perspective. Um, one of the things that we enforce, uh, both as civil and criminal law, is are things like price fixing agreements or market allocation agreements. Back in the, the old days uh, of the, 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 the trusts, uh, it would be a, you know, the proverbial smoke-filled room with a bunch of 
fat dudes in three-piece suits, smoking cigars, fixing prices. Uh, and then it became a little bit more like folks on email writing emails or texts back to each other about how to fix prices or allocate markets. Um, as AI takes on uh, a much greater role and as business is condu conducted programmatically, now we're going to have a world where individuals aren't necessarily agreeing themselves to fix prices or allocate markets, but their AI is doing that. Yeah, Bing will just say, it looks like you're trying to fix some prices. Would you like some help with that? <laughs> <laughs> or your two AI might start talking to each other and realize that it's efficient. And so, um, you know, these are the kinds of challenges that we're preparing for. We've always said we're going to keep the Hard Fork podcast free because we don't want any trouble with you guys, okay? So it's just going to keep it at zero and hope that's okay. Uh, well, everyone give a big hand to Jonathan Cantor. Thank you for joining us. And do you want to stick around? I'll stick around. Stick around. We, we have one more treat, and this is uh, exciting. This is the audience participation portion of today's podcast. Yes. So we have our first ever uh, uh, quiz game that is going to happen on this stage. Um, and it's a little game that we developed called Bot or Not. Hmm. So in this game, we will present each other with a series of, of creations, media objects, if you will. And um, some of these I know the answers to, and some of these Casey knows the answer to, and I don't. Um, and so we will quiz each other, and you, with your help, we will try to decide whether these things were created by AI or humans. And together, we can determine whether humanity still has any value left. <laughs> yeah, this is sort of like, it's occurring to me that we're, we basically designed a, a CAPTCHA. <laughs> <laughs> Pick out all the red stop signs. Okay, so our first question, and you can help us out with this too. Um, are these real TikTok trends, or were these created by an AI? I would say AI. Fake I it's think it's hashtag, so we have three trends. Hashtag fake it till you make it. Um, and I can give you some more uh, details uh, about these. This is a, a, a hashtag where you pretend to be someone else. Um, hashtag break the rules, and the hashtag dare me challenge. Um, Casey and Jonathan, do you believe that those are real viral TikTok trends or did an AI come up with those? What I would say is fake until you make it, that actually sounds like a real trend. If it was just that on stage, this would be very difficult for me. I think the dare me challenge sounds exactly like what an AI would say if you said, give me a fake trend. Yeah, I'm going to say AI. It just feels a little boring. You think this is bot? What do you guys think? Bot or not? Bot. Bot. Getting a lot of bot. You are correct. This yes. was Bing Chat's uh, answer to the question. Imagine three viral TikTok challenges that might sweep the nation's youth, shocking and alarming parents and teachers. <laughs> <laughs> you got to get a little creative with the prompts on these. I love that. OK, I, here's our next question. I, I don't know the answer to this one. This one, this one Casey made. So. All right, Kevin, is this a taco that I ate while working on these slides, or is this an image from Dolly? Well, it doesn't have the dolly. Dolly has a little watermark in the in the corner, but this is a very realistic looking taco. Uh, I can't see the rest of the hand, unfortunately, because usually hands are the giveaway with AI generated images because they all have like seven fingers. Mm -hmm. But, but confusingly, one... I have seven fingers, so. <laughs> it's been a weird couple months yeah. for you. Um, uh, Jonathan, what do you think? That's gotta be a real taco. It's okay. gotta be a real taco. Real taco? I'm, gonna, I'm gonna say uh, real taco too. So this is this one I'm saying not. Bot. This one was also a bot. Also a bot. Dolly, wow. quite good. Um, all right, next question. Also, I'm hungry now. Is this A, a real photo that I took at a Google, a Google Glass meetup during South by Southwest 2014? Or B, a stable diffusion image creating the prompt photo of a Google Glass product team Group indoors nerdy conference. <laughs> <laughs> I there there is something about. Will the, you just describe the image for, yes. for listeners? So it's uh, I I I'm not sure if I can see the whole photo, but I, I see at least uh, six people, and they're sort of wearing their conference lanyards, and they're wearing Google Glass, 
And the thing about it that makes me feel like it's a real image is that it feels like blurry and the lighting is bad in exactly the way that any smartphone camera photo from 2014 is. Like, so the, it, it just looks like a 2014 photo to me. So I'm going to say real photo. All right, that's your vote. Jonathan? Yeah, um, I'm, I think either would be frightening, but it's, it's not. <laughs> what, what do you guys think in the audience? Bot or not? <laughs> not. A lot of nots. Okay, uh, you're correct. This oh. is not. This is an actual image that I took at uh, South by Southwest 2014 in the heady days of Google Glass. And All what right. a time that was. <laughs> Next question. We're going to play an audio clip, and you're going to say, is this a recording of Elon Musk obtained through rigorous, rigorous sourcing within Twitter, or B, a synthetic voice sample that I created using Eleven Labs' new AI voice cloning tool? So let's uh, play this clip. I can't believe these guys keep talking about me on their dumb podcast. I'm just trying to extend the light of consciousness and destroy the woke mind virus over here. What kind of a name is Hard Fork anyway? I'll show them a Hard Fork. <laughs> okay, Casey and Jonathan, is this bot or not? <laughs> Casey. Oh God, I wish it were real. <laughs> I wish it were real so bad. Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say, say no, but that was honestly, I think, the best synthetic voice we have played on the show so far. Yeah, agreed. it was very good. Well, no, it's not a synthetic voice. Oh, I'm maybe sorry. it is. Maybe it is. Maybe it isn't. What do you think, Jonathan? I think I want to be friends with that bot. <laughs> <laughs> what do you guys think, bot or not? Bot. Sadly, that was a bot. Although, <laughs> if you have, if you're any Twitter employees are in the audience today and you do want to leak us uh, <laughs> audio of Elon Musk talking about the Hard Fork podcast, get in touch. I think like, should we actually have like fake Elon Musk read the credits each week? <laughs> like. <laughs> I think so, although he's very litigious, so I don't know good if point. I want to go there. Good point. Um, all right. I know a good lawyer, though. <laughs> all right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. The, here is a, uh, a, a four uh, options, four quotes from tech leaders, three of which are real, and one of which was hallucinated by ChatGPT. So, um, Casey and Jonathan, uh, I'll, I'll just read them out. Option one, uh, Don't Follow Your Passion by Mark Andreessen. <laughs> Option two, If people don't have more children, civilization is going to crumble, Elon Musk. Option three, In the next two decades, we envision a world where we have permanent settlements on the moon and Mars, as well as other celestial bodies in our solar system, Jeff Bezos. Option four, Spam will be a thing of the past in two years' time, Bill Gates. So, Casey, uh, which of these do you think was generated by ChatGPT? I am going to guess Jeff Bezos because I have trouble um, hearing him in my mind saying celestial bodies. And also, I don't think that even he thinks that that's going to happen within two decades. So that's my pick. Jonathan? I'm choosing between two and three, but I'm going to go with three. Three, Jeff Bezos. Um, what about you guys? What do you think? Three. Okay, uh, we, have some too four, we have some fours as well. You guys are too good. This was, in fact, uh, an, a hallucinated quote from Jeff Bezos by ChatGPT. <sighs> All right. We're doing pretty well. Next round. Here are two recipes. One of them is real, and one of them was generated by GPT-3. Option number one is roasted turkey with a soy ginger glaze. Option number two, shortbread cookies with olives and rosemary. Casey, which do you think was generated by GPT-3? Oh, well, I want to say two because I hate olives. And the shortbread cookies with olives and rosemary? Yes, but I'm noting that the first recipe begins, this roasted turkey recipe is inspired by the flavors of my childhood, which is like the most generic recipe intro ever that I think a chatbot actually would, would use because it believes that that is how recipes are supposed to begin is with 18 paragraphs of personal history. Um, this is, this, I think this might be the hardest one. Let, let me uh, phone a friend. Uh, do you, how many of you guys think it's one? One is, how many of you think the roasted turkey with the soy ginger glaze is the GPT-3 so bot Maybe a recipe? third to, of hands to half hands, and then how many think it's two? Wow. It's like 50 Pretty 50. even. It even, really is 50-50. Even split. Jonathan, okay. what do you think? Well, I still have faith in humanity, so yeah. I'm going to say two. You're going to say two. Um, and I think I'm going to say that one is fake. Wow, Okay. 
so Casey thinks that the roasted turkey with the soy ginger glaze was written by a robot. Uh, Jonathan thinks that shortbread cookies with olives and rosemary was generated by a robot. The correct answer is the bot created roasted turkey nice. with the soy ginger glaze, yeah. the recipe from childhood. And the real recipe was uh, shortbread cookies with olives and rosemary. And if you look under your chair, we've actually baked, we've roasted you a turkey <laughs> with soy ginger glaze. <laughs> we were no. up all night roasting turkeys for you. <laughs> Thanks to our colleagues at New York Times Cooking, both for the real recipe and the GPT-3 generated one. Um, for our last question, we have a special bonus round. Bonus round! And even I do not know the answers to this one, although our producer has texted them to me, so I have them in my pocket. Um, bonus round, here are uh, six descriptions of reality game shows. Um, some of them are real, and some of them are fake. We're generated by uh, GPT-3. So I'm gonna just read out the titles. Um, Singles Inferno, this is a show about um, flirty singles searching for love on a, on a deserted island. Then there's The Line, how long would you stand in line for $100,000? Contestants try to wait each other out to win a huge cash prize. Yeah, I've actually uh, played that game uh, trying to get brunch in San Francisco. hey -o. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, show number three, I Want to Marry Harry. This is single American women compete for the heart of a Prince Harry lookalike who, who they are led to believe is the real thing. Who, who goes on the show <laughs> to win the heart of a Prince Harry lookalike? <laughs> uh, uh, I hope that one's real. Number four, celebrity toe wrestling. This is celebrities compete in a toe wrestling tournament. The first celebrity to pin their opponent's toe wins. Uh, <laughs> Show number five, Close Encounters of the Dating Kind. This is singles who believe they were abducted by aliens go on dates with each other, <laughs> trying to find a compatible partner who shares their unusual experience. And number six, Celebrity Swap, which is famous personalities switch lives for a week. Watch as a famous athlete takes on the role of a Broadway performer or a celebrity chef tries their hand at being a professional wrestler. So, Casey and Jonathan and our, and our audience here at South by Southwest, which of these were created by a bot. All right, and do we assume that, that it's like three and three? Uh, I don't think we can assume that. Okay. All right. I don't, I don't actually know, but I don't. I, that's not in the description, so so I don't think we can assume that. Here, here I, I, we could work through these a, a few different ways. I would like to start by saying the one which I think is most obviously actually a, a show. Okay, but hurry up because we only have two minutes. Okay, I think Celebrity Swap is definitely real. Is definitely real. Yeah. Okay. I think I want to marry Harry. Oh, that is so plausibly real. Um, I feel like Quibi could have greenlit that one. Yeah, yeah. 100%. Um, I'm going to say it's real just because I actually have trouble imagining like chat GPT coming up with Prince Harry lookalike. Like that seems like beyond it. So let's say that that one is real too. Um, Singles Inferno is fake because it's too generic. Oh. And I think Close Encounters of the Dating Kind is generic, too. Yeah, that, that one looks a little... Well, no, but that, that I can see that on sci-fi. I can see that well, on sci-fi. I think that's fake. And I think celebrity toe wrestling is fake. Um, just the first I don't celebrity, know, man. The, the first celebrity to pin their opponent. All these sound toe. kind of... Jonathan, do you have any thoughts on these? All these sound kind of plausible to me. Yeah, they do. Um, I'm going to say that celebrity toe wrestling and the line are bots. Celebrity toe wrestling and the line are bots. Okay, Casey? Celebrity toe wrestling... Singles Inferno and Close Encounters are bots. And I'm going to say that Singles Inferno and Celebrity Swap are bots. Okay, let me open up my uh, text message here from our producer and see... These results the... certified by Ernst & Young. Okay, so it looks like four of the six were by bots. Oh. The only real reality game shows on this list are Singles Inferno... <gasps> And who wants to marry Harry? <laughs> <laughs> marry Harry oh, was real. The line, that was real. Uh, celebrity toe wrestling, the line, close encounters of the dating kind, and celebrity swap were all generated by AI. Uh, let's give everyone a big round of applause for playing Bot or Not. <laughs> um, wonderful. Well, uh, I think we, we learned some lessons, and we got some... some Food for thought. Yes, and thank you to Jonathan Cantor for joining us, and thank you to all of you for joining us. Thank you so much. Thank you so we'll much. We'll see you next time.
Have a great South by Southwest. Have a great South by Southwest.